right. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation celebrating Pride Month. Every month, Kenjin delivers a mini course that is relevant to the national diversity calendar. And June is Pride Month. So today, we will discuss how to become an ally uh, to the LGBTQIA plus community. My name is Kennedy Cobbin Richardson, and I am a partner at Kenjin. We are a consulting firm specializing in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we bring an innovative and holistic approach to developing people, teams, and culture in organizations who, um, who pursue purpose as well as profit. So our training is a 12-step course that helps people, one, acquire the essential skills to have courageous conversations. Secondly, we acknowledge, we help people acknowledge and accept the history and context of injustice in America. And certainly there are many communities uh, that are experiencing injustice. And so injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere. Number three, we help people articulate the lived experiences of marginalized groups so that when that marginalized group is in the room, um, that they are still represented by people who you know, don't uh, share their same experience, but those uh, in those spaces, it can be recognized. And fourth, uh, our goal ultimately is to help you act as an ally to accelerate DEI wherever you live and work. June's presentation will help you understand the history of the pride movement and give you ways to be an ally to the LGBTQIA plus community. A little bit about me. Um, I, uh, my passion is helping people become allies with marginalized communities. I am a DEI consultant for multinational corporations and nonprofits. Um, my specialties are youth development, work, workforce development, healthcare, and financial services. My titles include a nonprofit executive director for two youth serving nonprofits, a senior director of communications and business engagement uh, for the Workforce Development Board uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, and a marketing professional for AmeriFirst Financial and Pfizer Pharmaceuticals. Again, my passion is really helping people embrace both themselves and society on their journey to allyship. And so what is an ally, um, just to be specific, because there are a lot of terms thrown out there, but we want to ensure um, that we're using the correct language, which is a lot about what today is. And it's a person of one social identity group who provides actionable support to members of another group. And so it, it, it requires action. It's the difference between an advocate and an ally. Um, typically a member of the dominant group forms an alliance with a marginalized individual or group that is being discriminated against or treated unjustly. And so here's a short video um, on the price of exclusion. Individuality. It's something we all have in common, but for some, the thing that makes them different being gay, lesbian, bi, trans, or intersex marks them out for abuse. According to surveys, between half and two-thirds of LGBT youth experience bullying in childhood, forcing one in three to skip or even drop out of school. Many LGBT adolescents are rejected by their parents and thrown out of the family home and end up living in the streets. Some 40% of homeless youth living on the streets of major U.S. cities identify as LGBT or queer. Bullying, isolation, and rejection leave deep scars. Gay and lesbian youth are up to four times more likely to contemplate suicide compared with their straight peers. While young trans people are almost 10 times more likely to have attempted suicide than the general population. Workplace discrimination is widespread. In a recent European survey, one in five LGBT people reported experiencing discrimination at work in the past year. Studies suggest rates of joblessness, poverty, food insecurity, and depression are all higher among members of the LGBT community. For the individuals in question, these are personal tragedies. For the wider community, they represent an enormous waste of human potential, of talent, of creativity and productivity that weighs heavily on society and on the economy. A study that looked at 39 countries found a clear link between the marginalization of a country's LGBT community 
and a corresponding loss of potential economic output. The cost of homophobia and transphobia is simply colossal. From a shrunken labor force and a flight of talent to lost productivity, According to a recent World Bank pilot study, discrimination against lesbian, gay, bi, and trans people could be costing an economy the size of India's up to $32 billion a year. The drag on growth filters into lower tax receipts for the government, meaning less money for health, education, and other essential services. No wonder the UN calls combating homophobia and transphobia both a human rights priority and a development imperative. This cycle can be broken. More and more countries and companies recognize the benefits that flow from tackling homophobia and transphobia. For companies, that might mean adopting new corporate policies to make the workplace safe, fair, and accepting for all LGBT people. And looking at their business practices up and down the supply chain for ways to reinforce anti-discrimination efforts. For countries, it means new laws and effective public education and training. The result, a world that is free and equal and more prosperous too. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce to you Sai Bernabe, um, and, and Sai has been a social justice warrior for over 20 years. They have worked with the AIDS Project Los Angeles, AIDS for AIDS of Nevada, and the LGBT Center of Southern Nevada. They are dedicated to an intersectional and inclusive approach to teaching and community mobilizing. They identify as queer, transmasculine, and non-binary, and use all pronouns. They've worked as an outreach worker, case manager, and educator with HIV plus people, gender diverse communities, and LGBTQ plus youth. I am so excited to introduce to you uh, Sai, who is leading Gender Justice Nevada, and you are in for a treat. And so I'm going to stop sharing stop, Sai so that you can take over this presentation. Welcome. beginning. All right. So um, as I said, my name is Cy Burnaby. One little correction, and this is my fault because it's still floating around the internet. I actually don't use all pronouns anymore. I use exclusively they and them. Um, but as we get to pronouns and talking about those things, um, I'll definitely address that and why some folks change pro pronouns and what that means. Um, so first, I want to bring your attention to the flag that you see on that on that first slide there. That is the most up to date pride flag that we are now using. Uh, the original pride flag, which was created by Gilbert Baker in 1977, the year I was born, uh, and then it uh, it uh, premiered the year after at uh, the uh, at the Pride Festival. Uh, it actually had more stripes, but they had a hard time getting a hold of the dye for all those stripes. So uh, eventually, within the next year, they settled on the six stripes that you see. Uh, a couple of years ago, they uh, they debuted the Philadelphia Pride flag, which included the black and brown stripes to denote the color in our community, the spectrum of color in our community, not just black and brown communities, but all of the colors uh, within our rainbow community, because there has been a history of exclusion in our community. So it was a way of saying, you know, our community is diverse and uh, and to be inclusive of all folks. They then added the blue, pink, and white stripe, and that is the transgender colors. And then the yellow with the purple circle is the intersex flag, the purple uh, circle denoting that intersex people are whole and um, beautiful in and of themselves, uh, regardless of you know medical interventions, things like that. So. Okay, so you already did the introduction. I don't think I have to do this anymore. Uh, but but one thing I do wanna say is that I got started doing this kind of work in the 90s. So I started doing work in high school and in college in the HIV AIDS community. And that is back when we were still having funerals every weekend. Um, we The cocktail had not come out yet. So people were still using AZT. And this was at the height of queer activism at the time in the 90s. This is when the word queer was reclaimed by the group Queer Nation. Um, um, we saw ACT UP 
we saw a lot of direct action activism. And so this is when I got involved in college and it really helped form kind of the kind of activist I am, the kind of community organizer I am and how I teach. Uh, I came out as gay in 1997 and nobody was openly gay at that time. This is before Ellen DeGeneres even came out or Rosie O'Donnell or any of the athletes and politicians we see now that are openly gay. Um, I remember thinking when I came out, you could literally count on one hand the amount of, of openly gay celebrities. It was like Elton John, Melissa Etheridge, and uh, like Boy George. Um, everybody else, it was a secret. And so coming out in the late 90s, what that meant was that you didn't have access to a lot of the inclusive language that we have now. So you could either be gay or lesbian or bisexual or trans. Um, and so when I came out, I was like, okay, well, I guess I'm a lesbian because I was assigned female at birth and I'm gay. And for the next 20 years, I kind of played this role as a very soft, butch, androgynous lesbian and identifying as cisgender. And it wasn't until the last couple of years um, that I really went on this gender journey and started thinking about my childhood and who I was and my adolescence and what that all meant and being a child and wanting to be a boy and, and being a tomboy and everything that that meant. And so in 2020, um, when a lot of y'all were at home, like, uh, you know, making sourdough bread, I was figuring out my pronouns and, you know, going on this journey. It was also that year that I had top surgery, which I'll get to that in a little bit, uh, and which is a gender affirming procedure um, and how that affected me and my identity and how I walk through the world now. So, um, let's uh, gender justice real quick. We are based in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, we are a local 501c3 uh, community-based organization. We are very small. We are very grassroots. Um, I like to say we're like kind of those radical troublemakers that um, work mostly with marginalized uh, folks within the greater queer community. Those are some pictures of our board members. We have a couple that we haven't got pictures yet. Uh, but to let you know of our services, we assist people with document change. Um, folks, when they come to Vegas, might want to know about trans support groups or trans friendly uh, medical providers. And so we help out with that. Uh, we also do policy work, empowerment, mobilization, advocacy, direct activism. Uh, because we don't have a C4, I can't tell you how to vote. I can't endorse candidates, but I can bring attention to the political landscape and to the politics that do directly affect trans folks. Within this past year, we've seen over 230 pieces of legislation being drafted that affect the LGBTQ community that are anti-gay pieces of legislation. Over 180 of those directly attack the trans community. And what happens is even if these bills don't go through, even if they don't make it out of committee, the message is still sent to the people, like to trans youth, that their schools are not safe places or that they are not welcome on sports teams. So even when this legislation doesn't go through, it still has a dramatic effect on our community. Um, this is the bulk of the work I do, which is inclusion trainings and talking to folks about who I am in our community. Um, I do trainings for community-based organizations, providers, businesses, politicians, teachers, sometimes parent groups. Uh, we also have an Out Loud Speakers Bureau where I train folks in our community how to tell their story, how to use it as a teaching tool, um, how to testify if you're in front of a congressional panel or a school board, how to tell your story effectively, how to work with the media. Uh, we're working with someone right now on writing a children's book. So any way that I can help folks edit and form their lived experience to teach other people, uh, that's where we see hearts and minds opening up. It's always that human story. For so many people, um, they, they think, act, and vote a certain way until a family member comes out. And then all of a sudden, they kind of shift and think, well, I didn't realize that all of this legislation and what's happening is directly affecting my grandchild or you know, my niece or my nephew. And um, before I do any trainings, I always want to say that I am not here to change your political ideology or your religious beliefs. That's not my job. My job is to simply shine a light on our community, talk to you about terminology that can be um, harmful, what language to use, how to understand pronouns, uh, because so, so many people don't have the intent to harm. But because of the lack of education, the impact is still the same. I talk to so many nurses who say, you know, I just don't want to mess up. I don't want to offend anybody. So if I get a transgender patient, I tend to kind of pull back and not say anything or, you know, switch that case to someone else who might know more. And that really affects us because then we see a lack of care 
or of inclusive services. And that's where we see disparities in healthcare of us not returning to that clinic or you know, going in and getting those annual checkups done because of those interactions. Uh, this is our mission statement, but I think we already kind of covered it. Um, again, we're, we are um, very, very much a radical group, very much an inclusive group, and very much trying to put a light on the segments of the career community that aren't often, you know, talked about or, or um, uh, made a, people made aware of. So I think you already went over some fantastic statistics, by the way. I'm a data nerd, and I really appreciated everything you put in that video because it was spot on. Uh, it's very true about LGBTQ youth. 80% um, of them feel unsafe at school because of how they express their gender. 15% of them drop out of school because of that harassment. And it's not just harassment from other students. We see it from administration. We see it from teachers, from coaches, from nurses. 40% of homeless youth are LGBTQ+. Uh, LGBTQ+. Um, that data comes from GLSEN and the Trevor Project, which are two really great resources if you are an educator. And then also I want to, we uh, the, the statistics before were really about LGBTQ, but I wanna talk about trans youth. Um, this is a st statistic that I, that I find really interesting is that trans youth who are accepted by their family have about a 41% suicidality. I would actually, I actually think that number is higher, but because that's self-reported, it's usually a lower number, but that number drops to 4% when they are accepted by their family. And that means respecting pronouns. That means allowing them to express their gender in, in how they want. All it takes is one adult, a teacher, a family member to decrease suicide ideation. And when LGBTQ youth attempt suicide, they usually have a higher lethality rate, meaning that they succeed at a higher rate than their hetero and cis counterpoints. Okay, so before we talk about terminology, I just wanna say I acknowledge that that alphabet soup goes on forever and ever and ever. I think that's a good thing as someone who came from a, a, a time when we only had four or five labels to put on ourselves to now, I, I, I tell people that we have like infinite labels. When people ask me how many gender identities are there, I always say it's infinite because there's so many, there's so much nuance to it, right? I, I kind of feel like it's like one of those soda fountains at, at McDonald's where you go and a little bit of cherry Coke and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's infinite in, in, in what you can have in that cup. And our gender and our sexuality is the same. It fluctuates, it moves. It moves with the language that changes. The cornerstone of linguistics is that it is a living, breathing thing. That's why they update the dictionary every year. So <clears throat> something, a caveat to know about these terms is that some terms are generational. The best example of that is the word queer. Um, that word, when I was a kid, was solely a slur. If you use that word, they were fighting words. <clears throat> it was meant to disparage the entire community. Uh, and again, it got reclaimed in the 90s. However, there are members of the community, my age and older, so we're looking at like boomers, um, who still do not like that term because it triggers a time for them when people only used it as a slur. So I'm very cognizant <laughs> excuse me, when I use that term, because for some people, it's not something that they embrace. Uh, people may use terms in a unique way. When I use the term queer, what I'm acknowledging is that that is my sexual orientation. That is my gender identity. I am gender queer. My politics are queer. The lens that I look through, everything is queer. But somebody else might disclose to you and they say, I'm queer, and it might just be their sexuality. So people might use terms in different ways. So uh, consider that when people tell you something that it might be, that might be different for them as somebody else's um, interpretation of a term. Some terms are racially specific and culturally specific. The, the two best examples of this are the term stud and the term two-spirit. So the term stud was created for and solely used for communities of color within the lesbian community. And it's meant to denote a butch, or a masculine lesbian. Um, and what I see happening is in the last five, 10 years, especially on social media, I see a lot of people using the term stud. Um, and what I do is I like to call in, not call out and say, hey, I just have a question. Do you know, I'm not assuming that you, you know, what your ethnicity or culture is because you, you know, a lot of people can be white passing, um, but do you know the history of this term and ask them like, how do you identify racially? And if they say I'm white, I say, okay, so just so you know, you're, you're now, you know, co-opting a term, you're appropriating a term that is meant for lesbians of color. And most folks don't know that they just like to use that term because it sounds really powerful and cool. 
Um, two Spirit is another one that is used only in indigenous communities. And I'll, I will break that term down too. If you don't understand someone's label, usually it's okay to ask, but you know, also consider that just because that person is in the intersex community, they might not want to be the encyclopedia of all of those terms and give you their life story and their, their reasoning for their identity, all of these things. Um, you can always, you know, call me up, text me, email me. I literally have 17 different PowerPoints to go over all different kinds of things. And then, of course, there is this wonderful thing called Google that, that you can use and, um, and check things out, too. And I'm going to give you some resources uh, at the end that will, if you want to further your education, you can go down these wonderful rabbit holes on the Internet. Okay, so hit, I love this infographic. It's from a website called allgaylong.com. And when I tell you there are infinite labels, this is what I'm talking about. These labels go on and on and on. Like you can click, it's interactive. Um, and what this is looking at is gender identity. If we look at sexuality on a spectrum, we look at the Kinsey scale from zero to six, which also acknowledges asexuality. But Kinsey did a study um, almost 100 years ago and saying that we all exist on a sexuality spectrum. Gender can be seen the same way, although there are some people who also see um, it not being on a spectrum, but more of a, 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 a spirit kind of um, format. But I like to look at it like on the spectrum and that we have masculinity and femininity. And then in the middle, we have this, uh, this wonderful space of being without gender or with all genders or non-binary. And um, so in the blue, you see the masculinity and that's where you will see the term stud. It is an offshoot of the, of the butch label. So it's considered under that umbrella. But that's a fun little uh, interactive website you can get on and just kind of click around and look at all kinds of things. So I'm not gonna go too much into sexuality labels because I feel like everybody knows what gay and lesbian and bisexual means, but I am gonna break down pansexual and bisexual. Pansexual, because that term got really popularized in the last couple of years. The, as a concept, it's been around forever, since the beginning of time. Um, but it wasn't until 2015 when Miley Cyrus came out as proudly pansexual. And that day, the Google search for that word went up 1,100%. So everybody's going to Google and going, what is pansexual? Miley Cyrus says she is. You know, does that mean I am? Um, it's basically just saying that you have attraction to people regardless of what their gender identity is. Um, it does not mean that you're gender blind. Some pansexual people do consider themselves gender blind, but that is not actually like the meaning of the word. Um, pan, the root of that meaning all. So as with, with pansexuality, we also have another term that often gets conflated with it, which is bisexuality. Bisexuality is not just easily simplified as attraction to men and women or attraction to both sexes. What it is, is an attraction to people uh, to two or more genders. So bisexual people can also be considered pansexual, but not all bisexual people want to use that term because they've been using the term bisexual for decades. They got the tattoo, they have the flag. Um, they don't want to jump over to pansexuality, although that also could um, define them and their sexuality. So bisexual, two or more pansexual attraction regardless of their gender. Then you also have omnisexuality, uh, which is a Greek word, which also means all. All three of those are very similar, somewhat interchangeable, but again, it is up to that person and that person alone to use whatever labels they want, whatever pronouns they want, whatever names they want. Okay. These are uh, examples of bisexual and pansexual folks in uh, popular media. I'm a big comic book fan, a big Marvel fan, a DC fan. People don't realize that with a lot of these characters, they are canonically queer. They have been since they were written. Dead Pool was written as somebody who was attracted to everybody regardless of gender. Harley Quinn is bisexual. She had relationships with Poison Ivy. The problem is there was guidelines in the 80s and 90s that prevented a lot of these comic book characters from pursuing that aspect of their character uh, because the, the the people at that time didn't want comic book characters talking about sexuality. And you could look back at, you know, media, television, movies to see how much a lot of that was straight washed and cis washed, but that's a whole different other uh, presentation. So let's talk about gender. It's a social construct. It changes throughout time. Uh, what we think of femininity now of makeup and wigs and dresses and heels, we consider that very hyper feminine now, but hundreds of years ago, that's what our founding fathers were wearing. So how we see femininity and masculinity often changes with the times. 
I love this graphic because it's done by a group called TSUR, which is the Trans Student Educational Resources. They have a wonderful website. I highly recommend it. But I like that they break down these specific categorizations. We all have a gender identity. Even if we are agender, which means without gender, we still are identifying in some way we are just lacking or without gender. So we either identify as female, male, or other. I identify as other. I identify as transmasculine and non-binary. Along with gender identity, we also have gender expression, which is feminine, masculine, or other. I have always been very masculine in my expression. When I was a little kid, I often was very much a tomboy. I was lucky to have two older brothers. I got all those hand-me-downs. Um, and I've always expressed myself very masculine or very androgynous. So that's why I consider myself trans masculine, not a trans man. Uh, it's again, gender on a spectrum. I'm very masculine, but not identifying as a man. And on the other end of the spectrum, you could see if someone is very trans feminine, but not identifying as a trans woman. It's also referred to as demisexuality. Okay, so who are trans folks? Uh, there's a million and one definitions of transgender. This is the one that I use for my teaching purposes. It's someone who identifies as a gender other than what is expected in relation to their sex assigned at birth. And again, this is separate from your sexual orientation. So you could be transgender and be straight. Uh, you could be non-binary and you can be a lesbian. There's some discourse about that, which I love because I love these conversations, but there's gender identity and then there's sexual orientation. Um, this can include, by the way, not only being transgender, but non-binary, transmasculine, transfemme, genderqueer, genderfluid. There's literally dozens and dozens of beautiful words, labels, and micro-labels. Uh, one thing I want to say, though, is that a lot of times we look at transgender as this umbrella and all of these terms underneath it. Uh, there are non-binary people who do not consider themselves trans. Uh, there are two-spirit people who do not consider themselves trans. So just because it's considered a micro-label, label, it doesn't mean that that particular person considers themselves part of the, the bigger community. Okay, so what does it mean to be trans? First of all, one thing I really, if there's anything you leave this presentation with, know this. It has nothing to do with body parts, medical procedures, or hormones. Um, the reason I say that is because this is a gatekeeping um, tactic that a lot of people use. And they use this with being gay as well. And, and this is a, a way to invalidate people. And this is a way to shut them down. But having surgeries affirms gender but it doesn't make you any more trans than anybody else. A lot of trans folks um, do not get gender affirming procedures for many reasons. One of the biggest reasons is the financial cost. Um, most of those surgeries, anywhere from a couple thousand dollars up to $75,000. There is a lot of red tape in working with insurance and Medicaid to pay for those. And that varies from state to state as to how affirming your insurance carrier is. If you have to go through HR, all of these things. Uh, so because of that cost, a lot of people don't do those things. There are also people who do not like going under anesthesia. There's also a very healthy mistrust in our community of medical providers. And so even going to a therapist might be problematic because it might trigger past abuse. So for me, I identify as transmasculine. I did get top surgery, which is a basically, it's a removal of your, of your breast tissue and fat, very similar to a mastectomy. Um, I saved up for years because I didn't have health insurance at the time. That was $9,600 out of pocket. Uh, but before I had top surgery, I always had, again, very masculine expression, everything, haircut, um, name, all of these masculine things. And what would happen is like, I would go into a public restroom and then somebody would like tap me on the, uh, you know, if I was, and my back was to them and say, excuse me, sir, you're in the wrong restroom. And then I would turn around and then they would see my breasts and go, oh, I'm sorry. Obviously, you know, all these things. And all of that affects how your gender dysphoria and how you see yourself. So I could, and sometimes this lends to like the politics of passing. Um, but for me, that was something that caused me a great deal of dysphoria. So, and, you know, to put it into like, so that you can kind of understand that um, I had very big breasts. I would try to use a binder, which is like a compression bra. I really love the winter time when you can wear like layers of clothing and, you know, big, big shirts and stuff, but that's not possible in the summer. Um, but I had, because I'm Italian and I'm gifted like that, I had 36, uh, I'm sorry, 34 double D cup size, 
which is very big. For those of you without breasts, if you want to compare it to something, each breast weighed about seven, I'm sorry, six to eight pounds for each one. That's about the size of a rotisserie chicken at a grocery store. So it's very hard to hide this. When I got top surgery, it was the greatest thing ever. I immediately went out and bought small t-shirts. I'm at the pool parties. Um, I felt such a sense of pride and, and self-worth in living in the body that I know matched my gender. Um, but again, if people are not having those procedures, they're not doing those things, they are not on hormone replacement therapy, it does not make them any less trans. And it can be um, very damaging and harmful to ask them, oh, well, have you had the surgery yet? Are you on hormones? All of those things can be very invasive questions and should not be asked. Okay, here's the words to not use. This is the part of the training I like to call how to not be an a-hole, okay? Please don't use these words. Don't use the term he, she. If you don't know somebody's gender, it's very invalidating. None of us, even the most androgynous people are a he, she. Uh, transgendered is not a word. Uh, I see it in media a lot when they talk about folks. Ellen DeGeneres did not get lesbian. Uh, I did not get transgendered. It's not something that happened to me. The term transsexual is very outdated. And again, there they are linking sexuality and gender identity. Uh, the term tranny is somewhat debatable because we still use it. We still embrace it within our community. Um, but words that are used in our community by us, it doesn't necessarily mean allies outside of the community can use those terms. And that is very similar in many other cultures that outside you respect that that language belongs to us. Uh, hermaphrodite is an outdated term for intersex. Now, cross-dressing uh, is still, it, it is more seen as a fetish or something that folks do, but not intrinsically tied to sexuality or gender identity. There still are people who use that term for themselves. And again, if somebody uses it for themselves, it is not anybody's place, even mine as an educator, to say, actually, we're not using that term anymore. There are a lot of people who use those older terms because that validates them and that empowers them so they use that. I know folks in the trans community who still say, I'm a proud transsexual because that is what they fought for decades ago. The term transvestite is also very outdated. At the bottom there, please never use dead names. Dead names are the names that people went by if they did change their name. Not all trans folks change their names, but it's the name that they were born with and assigned. Uh, uh, my dead name is all over the internet, so you can find it because I've done activism before I changed my name, but I prefer people not know it and not know that about me. I even look at that name now and it's almost like a different person. Um, that name ended in an A and I am not feminine in any way. So when I changed my name, it, I, the feeling of like, that is me, that's, that's finally me. I finally see and, and know myself in that name, but it is never okay to ask people what their dead name is. If you are a provider and you have paperwork, like whether you're a police officer or you're a nurse and you have a file and they have not legally changed that name, the best thing to do is ask them, is this the name you go by? Are these the pronouns you use? And there should be a space somewhere on that client file that can say this person goes by this name. It should not be preferred. It should not be a preferred pronoun or a preferred name. I don't prefer you use those things. That is my name. Those are my pronouns, whether I've legally changed it or not. Then when you're not interacting with that patient or with that person, then yeah, you sit down, you do the billing, you write the report in that old name, but please do not use that when you're interacting with them. Okay, social transition and medical transitioning. Social transitioning is just what I was talking about. Your pronouns, how you uh, express your gender, your name, things like that. That is social transitioning. That is usually the first couple of steps for someone on their gender journey, although it is not always like this linear journey. Sometimes we change our name. For me, I went through a couple different um, versions of like what I wanted my pronouns to be because I wanted it to fit. When it finally fit, that's when I said, okay, that's where I really like they, them. And again, some people go and do social transitioning and don't have any medical transitioning. Okay, another thing I hope you leave with is this, and this goes to gatekeeping, but gender diverse people, meaning trans, non-binary, everybody under that gender diverse spectrum, do not know owe anybody hyper femininity or hyper masculinity. Um, you should not expect that if somebody's identifying as a trans woman, that they are hyper feminine. Because we don't expect that of, of cisgender women. We don't expect that when women are walking around, they're always in makeup and heels and a dress and things like that to accept and affirm them as a woman. So 
um, we need to kind of stop doing this gatekeeping and saying, well, you're not looking this way, so I'm not going to acknowledge you as that. As a non-binary person, uh, my aesthetic is pretty androgynous and masculine. However, if I want to wake up tomorrow and put makeup on, that's okay too. It does not take any away anything away from my non-binary identity. Okay, gender dysphoria is basically the condition or rather the medical diagnosis of one's emotional, physical, and psychological identity to be different from what the sex assigned at birth is. And again, we're all assigned male, female, or other by a doctor or a midwife. For me, I never felt that connection to being a girl or to being a woman. And so a lot of things caused gender dysphoria for me. The biggest was my chest. I got that taken care of. I don't feel like I have dysphoria in other places. There are trans folks who would define it and say that all trans folks need to have dysphoria to be trans. I do not believe that. Uh, there are some things that still, for me, I don't love. Um, if I, I'm not on testosterone right now. Uh, there's a couple of reasons why. I'm not a fan of needles. Most of it is injected. The gel and the patch is more expensive. Um, also, anytime we look at medicine, we have to look at the side effects and we have, because it affects all of our bodies different. We can all be on the same med, our body will all react to it differently. And with testosterone, one of the big side effects is hair loss or thinning of hair. I'm Italian. Uh, my hair is very important. My ancestors, if they saw me going, you know, losing hair, um, I'd probably be <laughs> a joke within my community, within my family. I like having hair. I do not want to lose my hair. Also, when you take testosterone or estrogen, you essentially are going through a second puberty. I did not like puberty the first time around. I didn't like the acne. I didn't like the awkwardness, the emotions, things like that. I don't want to go through it a second time. I would like some of the benefits, like the fact that um, when you take testosterone, your voice lowers by octaves, usually within the first couple of months. Uh, that does not happen for estrogen with trans feminine folks. It does not, their voice doesn't, um, doesn't go up. Usually it takes vocal lessons to help out with that. But I, the, to me, the pros do not offset the cons to taking testosterone. Okay, and if there's any questions, you can throw them in the comments or wait till the end. I have probably about 10, 15 more minutes. So the term trans, uh, cisgender, I just put out there. Cisgender is not the same as straight. Don't conflate it with that. It simply means that your sense of your gender does align with what was assigned at birth. And obviously, if you do not have anxiety going into public restrooms like I do, um, then that is a privilege that you don't feel that, that, that imminent harm that could happen. A lot of trans folks, um, even in the summertime when it's 112 degrees outside, purposely do not drink fluids throughout the day. So they are not forced to using a public restroom. And that is obviously very dangerous in this kind of heat. But uh, most trans folks I know have, have said, I just, I'm not gonna drink a lot at lunch because I don't have to go use a public restroom. Um, gender neutral restrooms are great. I think they benefit everyone. Uh, in Europe, they have them a lot. They are safe, you know, that's a whole nother lecture of talking about that. There has never been one documented case of a trans person going into a restroom to assault anybody. That has never happened. It's a false narrative to stigmatize us and to frame us as, you know, as predators and other us. Okay, so uh, let's talk about healthcare real quick because there's a lot of disparities with healthcare. If we look at the minority stress model, which was originally created to kind of look at race, religion, things like that. We can also apply it to the LGBTQ community. 8% of gay folks have been refused treatment. 27% of trans patients have been outright refused treatment by providers. Sometimes providers just say, listen, I don't know enough about trans healthcare. I can't be your primary care doctor. Or if I take on a trans patient, I will inevitably get more trans patients and that will alienate my, my, my patient base. Um, this happens all the time. It is legal in many states. Because of that, again, we have a healthy mistrust of medical establishments. 29% of trans folks have had to explain who they are, their bodies, their health care. Um, I've had many doctor appointments since my top surgery. And one of the questions they ask you is, in the last couple of years, have you had any surgery? I say, yes, I've had top surgery. What is that? That is a removal of breast tissue. Uh, it's much like, a mis or actually, I, and I stop there and I say it's a removal of breast. And they say, oh, I'm so sorry, you had cancer. And I say, no, I did not have cancer. Top surgery is a gender-affirming surgery. 
for trans folks, trans masculine folks. And there I have to go into the reasoning, the gender dysphoria, all of that. That is, should be general knowledge to anybody in the medical field, what top and bottom surgery is. However, 80% of medical school students are not trained in how to support LGBTQ folks. So what ends up happening is they end up kind of retreating and saying, I don't know what to say. I don't wanna say something stupid. So they end up passing that patient to somebody else or just not interacting with that patient, which as is has the same impact. Okay, so let's dive into some of the terms. I'm gonna go over the ones that are most popularized right now because I can't possibly go into all of them. Gender fluid is a person whose gender identity is not fixed. So it might be, uh, feminine one day, it might be androgynous another day, it might be masculine. I know people who will change their name tags at work or change bracelets to denote that today is like a feminine day, today is like more of a butch masculine day. Um, sometimes it's day to day, sometimes it's season to season, but there is just a, fl a fluctuation with their gender expression and sometimes their gender identity. Some gender fluid folks do consider themselves trans and some do not. Okay, gender non-conforming. I see this a lot with folks who identify as straight and heterosexual, but still challenge what uh, the expectations of their gender are. Down at the bottom in the middle there, you have Jaden Smith, who is Will and Jada's son, who identifies as heterosexual, who is a model. And he often goes to award shows and models wearing very feminine clothing, very couture stuff, identifies as gender non-conforming, but not trans. Okay, and I want to remind everybody who thinks that this is all new terminology and new concepts, that this is something millennials have brought to the, this country, that, that we just started this years ago. This is not true. We have had artists and people in culture since the beginning of time who embraced gender fluidity and gender nonconformity. And one of the best examples of that is Prince. He literally said in his lyrics, I am not your woman, I am not your man, I am something that you'll never understand. And he embraced that with his performances, with everything he is, he embraced that. So did David Bowie, so did Elton John, so did Boy George, so does Janelle Monet, all of these artists doing that. And maybe not necessarily identifying as trans, but still having that expression outside of the gender that's expected of them. Two Spirit, uh, I highly recommend the documentary Two Spirit. I think right now it's on Amazon, but it is a really good examination. It does go, uh, trigger warning, it does talk about hate crimes, um, but it is a very good documentary of this community. Um, the term Two Spirit is actually relatively new. It came around in the mid nineties at a conference up in Canada. Before then the term Burgash was used, but that is seen as very outdated now. This is not to be conflated with LGBTQ plus indigenous people. This is more of a gender identity and expression. Two Spirit folks um, embrace and, and hold within them masculine and feminine spirits. And because of that, they are seen as having gifts. They are shamans. They are healers. They are, they are caretakers within the tribe, usually hold higher roles. They lead ceremonies. Uh, again, and they are seen in over 55 uh, different indigenous communities in North America alone. Non-binary, this is me. Uh, my, my favorite definition of non-binary is if somebody were to ask me, are you a boy or a girl? I simply say no. For some non-binary people, they could say both. They might say neither. They might say a little bit of both. My my kids like to say, um, and they refer to me as mom because I'm you know I I still I like that title. But they say that's my mama. She's she's kind of not really a girl, but she's really kind of a boy. But really, she's kind of you know both, but more boy. And it's really interesting to see how a bunch of eight year olds unpack a lot of these terms. It's been an interesting journey with them. Uh, but basically non-binary is people whose gender is not male or female beyond or both. And again, this can include many kind of micro labels like bi-gender, androgynous, gender fluid, and gender queer. Uh, drag is entertainment. Drag is not a gender identity or a sexual orientation, but it's basically when performers challenge fixed roles of gender and sexuality using very, you know, exaggerated costumes, mannerisms. There's many different kinds of drag. That's a whole nother presentation. That's me up in the corner with the nun's hat. I am a sister of perpetual indulgence. We do camp drag. We do fundraising, uh, activism. Next to me there is Sasha Valor, who's one of my favorite drag queens. They, uh, if you really want a good serotonin shot there for you, if you're having a down day, Google Sasha Valor uh, finale. It's on drag race, her with the flowers. 
Her mother passed away of breast cancer and that's what this performance is about. I promise you it'll bring you smiles. Then we have Spikey Van Dyke, who's a lesbian butch drag king. Gottmik, who is a trans man who does drag. He also got top surgery like I did and talks about that in a lot of his drag. And then Bob the Drag Queen, who also they are non-binary um, uh, drag queen and also I believe polyamorous. Okay, the intersex community. Intersex is a general term which is used for a variety of conditions. It's not just as simplistic as having ambiguous genitalia, but it is a many, many different kinds of conditions or variations uh, that includes external genitalia, internal genitalia, like gonads, ovaries, things like that, and chromosomal patterns that don't fit the typical male-female categorizations. It is 1.7 to 3% of births, which is the same amount of people that are born with red hair, uh, but they don't know exact statistics because historically, when children are born and assigned intersex, there is instant plastic surgery or immediate, I should say, plastic surgery that happens to them. So they might live their entire lives not knowing that they were born intersex. And for a lot of intersex folks, they might not consider themselves a part of the greater LGBTQ community because it is not necessarily a sexual orientation or a gender identity. Um, and they've also often been marginalized in our community. So a lot of them don't, don't feel welcome in our community. I would also, in looking at intersex identities, understand the unique medical issues, look at representation, look at resources, and know that, again, it is a, it is a completely different set of issues than we, we see with LGBTQ. Okay, these are some examples of uh, gender diverse people all over the world. And one of the things that I wanna say is, again, a lot of people think this is new, that this is, I, I say these identities have been around since the beginning of time. Non-binary, third gender, all of these identities have been around forever. But our history has been cis washed and straight washed. And so a lot of times we don't see the contributions of our communities all over the world. But if somebody ever says, like, we don't have people like that from the, the communities I come from, yes, you do. And I have a whole PowerPoint about the anthropology of gender, and I can talk about the Mushte of Mexico and the warriors of Indonesia and, and see that. But because we don't see it in media and pop culture, and we don't see it in history books, so many people don't think we've existed since the beginning of the time. Oops, sorry, one second. Okay, what pronouns? Here's what we were gonna get to, right? The whole thing is about pronouns. What pronouns do you use for trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming people? The general rule is whatever they use for themselves. I do pronoun checks with my friends every now and then because people might change their pronouns. And I am not on Instagram a lot. So if they made a declaration of a new pronoun on Instagram, I may not have seen it. So I still check in with people and go, hey, are you still using he, him? Are you still using they, them? I just wanna check to be respectful. So that's a good thing to do. Here's some of the caveats though. Not all trans people use binary pronouns. There are trans people who use uh, multiple pronouns. I know a lot of drag performers who might use he, him during the day and use she, her at night. So it's certain circumstances and how they're expressing themselves. Not all, oh, I'm sorry. Some people have exceptions. For me, I have a brother who is autistic, who um, is also development, uh, has developmental delay. So he is 51, but has a developmental level of probably a seven-year-old. He will always call me by my dad name, always refer to me as his sister. He will always use she, her pronouns because that is the relationship I have with my brother. If you are out with people and somebody is using an incorrect pronoun and you are there and that person is there, I would encourage you not to jump in and correct because that person, that trans or non-binary person may not have disclosed to that person their pronouns or their gender identity. So you have just outed them by doing that. So be careful. I know sometimes allies really jump, want to jump in and correct those things, but understand that, that that person might not be out. And also that person might still be figuring out pronouns. So you're, you're jumping in where you don't really need to. Um, not all binary people, non-binary people use they, them pronouns. Some use multi-pronouns. Some, some still use binary pronouns. There are some people who use no pronouns. And what do you do when somebody uses no pronouns? You simply use their name every time you talk to them. Um, Richard is going to the store. Richard's gonna bring me some milk when, he, when, when Richard comes home and then Richard and I are gonna watch TV together. Uh, is it a little wonky? Yes. Sometimes are these pronouns and using them hard to do? Yes, because what we're doing is shifting in our mind how we use pronouns. Uh, it does take some time. 
Um, but but you can do it. I, I remember 12 years ago meeting the first person that used they them pronouns. And I was like, how am I going to do this? I, I just don't, I don't think it makes sense, but it does. The next slide, I'm going to show you why it does, but let me get through this first. Um, don't assume someone's pronouns from gender expression. You don't have to say sir or ma'am. There's always this thing of like, well, we are taught to address people sir or ma'am, but that's binary. You don't have to. You can simply say, excuse me, or hello. Um, there's ways to get around that so you're not assuming. And apologize if needed. Don't dwell on it. Don't justify it by saying, oh, it's such a big adjustment for me. It's a big adjustment for us too. So you know, don't sit on it for a long time and justify all those things. Just say you'll do better next time. Okay, so they, them as a singular pronoun. I used to be a journalist. I used to write for City Life and Las Vegas Weekly. I went to college on a journalism scholarship. I can tell you that yes, words are made up every day and sometimes people misinterpret words. But how do we know a word is a word and its definition is we look at the dictionary. That is our reference point for words and how we use them. The dictionary is updated every single year because linguistics changes, words change, labels change. They, them is accepted in the Miriam, uh, uh, the, I'm sorry, the, the Miriam Webster dictionary. It was the word of the year as a singular pronoun in 2019. Shakespeare used it in his writing. Jane Austen used it in her writing. Uh, it is in the Chicago Manual of Style and the AP Style Guide. Again, those are what we look to and how we use words. Now, to break down, because a lot of people, again, are saying, well, this is a new thing. Um, it's being embraced by newer generations, but it is not a new thing. So 35% of Gen Zers, and this is the generation after Gen X, this is usually 20s and younger, 35%, one in three, know someone who uses they, them pronouns, 25% of millennials, 16% of Gen Xers, that's me, and 12% of boomers. But whatever category you fall into there, whatever generation you are, now you know someone who uses they, them pronouns. So you can say, I've actually um, seen a presentation by somebody who uses they, them pronouns. And even if you are of an older generation, um, this is happening. This is what is happening. So your grandchild might come out using they, them pronouns. This is gaining momentum and this is happening whether people like it or not. This is how we are approaching gender and this is how we are seeing pronouns now. So you can either kind of get on board, embrace it, learn about it, or but be one of those older people who still say pro, uh, problematic things and use language that is outdated. Okay, so um, how the, the best way to be an ally, and I so agree with that presentation earlier where it talked about being an active ally, is to look at a couple of things. Um, first of all, look at the language and the imagery you use in your business or how you provide services in your lobby. Um, are there things that welcome people that are uh, th that is inclusive when you have pictures, when you're doing marketing, when you're doing, um, you know, it, and I know it sounds kind of cheesy, that little rainbow flag, but that means a lot to us because that signals to us that uh, you, you are an ally, that you will accept us, that you will affirm us, and that you're willing to learn more. So not a bad idea to put that on things. Um, use pronouns, names, and terms appropriately. Keep learning, keep listening to stories. I literally update my PowerPoints every month. I take like a day out of the month where I go through all of them. I put in new data. I put in new terms. This, um, this presentation right now will be obsolete in three years. So please keep learning, keep using the resources that I'm going to get you to update your glossary and things like that. Also, don't assume that the people around you are straight and cisgender. I often teach to student nurses, and I've heard from many of them saying, hey, um, I, don't, I don't have any colleagues that are LGBT. I don't know any trans people. And I know trans people who are in the room, but they live what you refer to as a stealth life, meaning that they do not come out as trans and they simply identify as that binary man or woman. And usually that is done because of safety. They do not want to be outed. So you have had interactions with LGBTQ plus people. I guarantee you that you just might not know it. And the problem is that when we assume everybody is cis and straight, that's when people say gay jokes or they make disparaging comments about things. And that will pretty much guarantee that that person will not ever come out to you because they do not see you as a safe space. 
Here's some movies that are available to stream right now that I highly, highly recommend. There's an episode of Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness. It's on Netflix and it's called Can We Say Bye Bye to the Binary? And it really explores non-binary identities, two-spirit folks. It's an incredible, they did such a good job with this episode. I really recommend it. Disclosure is a documentary that's on Netflix um, that really examines how trans people are portrayed in the media and that up until recently, it was always very negative depictions, which is what made a lot of us not want to come out because we were always the victim or the villain. Um, same thing can be said for LGBTQ uh, folks in that historically they are not portrayed in positive lights. Boys Don't Cry is an amazing movie. I also recommend the documentary, The Brandon Tina Story that was done on his life. Southern Comfort is a documentary about the last six months of Robert Ede's life. He was a trans man who was dying of ovarian cancer, who was refused care by 11 different doctors and ended up dying because the cancer spread before he could be seen. He was actually accepted into some studies at the University of Georgia, but it was too late. Gender Revolution, I believe is still on Disney Plus, a really great documentary with Katie Couric. Paris is Burning is one of my favorite movies. <clears throat> it's from 1990 and it examines ballroom culture. So if you liked Pose, definitely check that out. And The Death and Life of Marsha P. Johnson, who was <clears throat> a trans activist, um, who there was a false narrative that she was the first one to throw a brick at Stonewall. She was not at Stonewall at the uh, at the beginning of the night. She came later on in the night and was there for the next couple of days of the Stonewall riot. All right, here's some resources. Uh, Human Rights Campaign has really great glossary that they update all the time. National Center for Trans Equality, another great website. And then also PFLAG. So if you are struggling because you have a family member or a friend or a colleague that has just come out to you. And by the way, when someone comes out, here's two really horrible things you can say to not say. Please don't say, oh, I already knew. It really invalidates us for those of us who have had to um, hide who we are. Then we think, oh my God, do, does everybody else know too? So please don't say I already knew. And then also don't say it doesn't matter because it does matter. Um, there are people who don't use labels and that's fine. But for a lot of us, finding the label, finding um, community is very important. So those two things, um, don't say those. Just say, that's great. Thank you for seeing me as a safe person that you could say those things to. I won't tell other people. And I'm really happy for you that you have found your truth and that you are on this journey now. So, all right, there's my contact information. Best way to get a hold of me is email or texting. Um, I'm on the socials. If you're on TikTok, I'm the gender rebel on TikTok. I do a lot of queer history, definitions, um, fun stuff like that. And so that is the end of my presentation. Mm -hmm.